In this story dissection and review video, I will be talking very, very specifically about urban slash suburban hazards and also means by which uh, people use terrain to their advantage in such a situation. Now, you had your character, Thompson, who was the... Uh, cop and the people traveling with him had just come out of underground. This yellow means you're seeing inside this drainage pipe that goes into this canal right here. Now, up here you see a convoy of uh, Chai Com APCs headed south, passing by. This is in Scottsdale, so this is like urban slash suburban Scottsdale, Arizona, as uh, part of the Phoenix story. Now, they just came from the underground, which is the collection of sewers and giant underground drainage systems, much like most major cities have, especially those cities in the West, like uh, uh, Las Vegas is well known for its uh, immense underground. It has entire communities of homeless people living in it. But one day, that very same concept might apply to more than just that class of people, when there's foreign troops shelling and rocketing and dropping munitions all over uh, urban areas. So I featured that prominently in my second story with the Phoenix Underground. Well, there's people living in the underground areas, and you had Thompson and his little group come out here in Part 14, and right as they got to the top of the canal... You had this neighborhood over here, this giant suburban uh, sort of a housing development. You can see the little driveways, the houses, the fences that separate the yards. Uh, here's the walkway that went between uh, the backs of these properties here. You can see these little yellow boxes. These are rooms that I'm letting you see through the ceiling in to see that there's a Chicom sniper and spotter team in each and every one of these buildings. Now, what happened was the moment that this group got to the top of the canal, two of the men were sniped by snipers in these uh, houses. Now, mines were laid in this field between this canal right here and the housing development right here. There was a bit of a minefield laid now, there's many ways mines can be laid. They can be actually dropped from planes. Uh, they can actually be sent with rocket artillery or even shell howitzer artillery can lay mines. So I didn't go into exact details of how so many anti-personnel mines were laid so quickly during the initial invasion because I believe this was like day two of the invasion. I didn't go into detail about that. It could have been done by hand, uh, artillery, or airdropped. But... What happened was you had those two guys getting sniped because these are just civilians, mind you. Now, this is really early in the invasion. Uh, most civilians are not hip to the type of dangers that will be uh, around in such an environment as a urban and suburban environment. You are going to have uh, sharpshooters or snipers or people like that that go and set up in buildings. You're going to have that, absolutely. That is a facet in every single solitary urban battle in modern human history. You are absolutely going to see that. So I featured that prominently in the story uh, right here in part 14. And now, as the other three, as Thompson and his other two guys uh, were running across the field to get here, they didn't even know it, but there were anti-personnel mines, and a man stepped on it, and it blew him into the blew him in the air, and, and and blew his leg off, and maimed the other one, and basically got him killed. They were not able to uh, tend to him because of the snipers. So yes, you're going to see things like that. You're going to see traps in an urban environment, mines. Um, you're going to see sniping. That's a big, big peril in an urban environment or a suburban environment like this. Well, they got, they got through this area very, very carefully, and they made it mostly by uh, staying on walkways, on like brick walkways or stone walkways and uh, driveways. And they, and they went from place to place until they got to this walkway here, which offered them some measure of cover and concealment. Now remember, 
hitting moving targets is very, very difficult, uh, especially when you have like a bolt action uh, uh, sort of a sniper rifle like these snipers uh, maybe had. Even if they didn't, it would have still been difficult to hit a fast moving target, which is why I featured them in the story sprinting from place to place and also staying on walkways and pavement uh, to avoid mines and booby traps. And they also ended up looking for traps uh, because once they lost a man to the mines here, they were very cautious after that. And these fences here on each side of these backyards, they went zigzag in a zigzag pattern running the whole way up to get to the park that they got to. And then they had to cross the park by uh, zigzagging and running behind boulders and mounds because they encountered chai comms and foxholes in that area in the park. And there was a park at the very end off this little mini map. There was a park uh, with playground equipment and things like that, and the chai comms were dug in there. Well, needless to say, Thompson lost his other guy that was left, the one guy that was left with him, and it was just him. So what Thompson did is after he got past the uh, playground, he went into a wadi system, and a wadi is like uh, a ravine in the middle of a desert that is uh, formed from either wind or water from when it rains in the desert. Sometimes they wash out uh, whole areas of uh, desert and make these wadis, which are giant cracks in the earth. Here's the canal, and here's the wadi system. And uh, you see they're using this terrain to their best advantage. They're using the wadis to keep low profiles, to keep their silhouettes low, so that they're not as easily seen and picked off from a distance. Um, and you had this battle raging here, and this is part 16 here, where this battle was raging over here at this, um, at this industrial park. Now these are like warehouse type buildings, uh, and they're all being surrounded by uh, a Chai Com tank company and a mechanized infantry grenadier uh, company with their APCs and tanks. The tanks are these, and then the APCs are just the regular boxes. Um, and you see that these all these warehouse-type buildings and uh, industrial buildings are being surrounded, and you can see the inside of this one. You see this wedge going in, and these two columns, another squad going in behind them, and they're fighting inside of here. Well, Thompson, after watching all this battle rage, he went up this wadi system to right here. And now that takes you to part 20 in the story. When he goes in this drainage culvert, and literally curls up in this culvert and treats his wounds from that uh, fragmentation anti-personnel uh, RPG round that basically he was on the edge of it when it blasted and uh, a little bit of shrap got caught in his legs. Uh, he had to go in that culvert and rip his shirt off and give himself some emergency first aid and he ended up spending the night in there because he hadn't been to sleep in a long time. Well... While that was going on, you still had that battle raging. I mean, it had calmed down a little bit at night, but this is just when he arrives to the culvert to hide in it underneath this uh, road right here, this street going into the industrial park. And over here, you know, you see the blown out walls and rubble of these warehouse buildings. You see the chai comes right here along this rubble, tossing grenades in. They're about to go in there and storm the place. There's a few Americans right there behind the rubble. You see their APCs, and you see the different formations they're in, and you see their um, IFVs and APCs. See, here's an APC. There's a guy in the turret. Um, and here's an IFV, an APC, IFV. And, of course, you got a main battle tank right here, which was uh, one of these. Uh, you see them going by and here's a tripod mounted uh hj8 being fired at this warehouse and uh yeah an rpg being fired from this guy got a lot going on so essentially those are some major major hazards that you're going to have in an urban slash suburban environment and i just really wanted to highlight the fact that you have to make the best use of all the terrain available to you. Even if it's an urban terrain or suburban, you need to be able to use things like canals and wadi systems to be able to stay low and keep your silhouette 
very low because the bigger a silhouette you have uh, and the slower you move, the easier you'll fall prey to various different things like uh, shown here by the snipers, you know, inside those rooms picking off people that go into the minefield that didn't even know that there were mines there until it was too late. Those types of things is how they create a kill box. They'll have like a minefield and snipers, you know, posted up and that becomes a kill box. And anybody that wanders into that is annihilated. That's also how they can occupy, in some places, large swathes of territory without having to use too many troops to do it. And that's just in the invasion phase. Now, in other areas, they will be devoting a lot of troops like you see them trying to uh, basically subdue this entire industrial park right here in the, in the suburbs. Now this is all in Scottsdale. Parts 14, 16, and part 20, where it ends with Thompson going in the culvert in part 20, that all takes place in Scottsdale. And he was trying to get out of the city because, again, evacuation, just like in the Broken Bow story, evacuation is one of the most important things. And more so than ever in an urban environment, you do not want to get caught in an urban environment because an urban environment is basically just a giant uh, death trap. The whole thing's basically a kill box. But in the next video, I will go into actual urban uh, tactics as shown in the second